Have you ever wondered what is causing your SIBO, your small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? What I like to actually call self-induced bacterial overgrowth? <laughs> well, stay tuned to this video to learn how you're self-inducing yourself with bacteria and overgrowing it. Alrighty, this is Josh Rubin from UCF Sailing, and today I want to talk about SIBO, self-induced bacterial overgrowth, or what the medical community likes to, or everyone out there that's playing doctor likes to say, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I want to talk about it because I feel like everyone I talk to, everyone I meet, everyone I come across, everyone's throwing out this term, SIBO, like it's a fad, it's something new, it's something cool to have. Everyone has it. Of course everyone has it. Well, the web definition, whatever that means, because it means absolutely nothing, but the web definition is, it refers to a condition in which abnormally large numbers of bacteria are present in the small intestine, while the types of bacteria found in the small intestine are more likely to be bacteria that are found in the colon. Now you have bacteria in your small intestine, you actually do most of your absorption in your small intestine. It's three parts, just to maybe throw that out at you. And you have bacteria, but not a ton. There's bacteria, more bacteria in other places like your colon. And this is where you absorb most of your food. So, of course, you're going to have digestive issues, absorptive issues, mineral deficiencies, and things like that. SIBO, or when you have this self-induced bacterial overgrowth, it basically affects the structure and function of the small intestine leading to digestion and absorptive issues, like I just said. So I'm kind of repeating myself, which is okay. So it can actually sink in. And as I mentioned, digestion takes place in the small intestine. And this is where you break down and absorb a lot of your nutrients. You have microvilli that look like this in your small intestine and microvilli along these villi that move food along and we absorb things and we digest things. Now, based on my research from the web, or other, you know, things, which I don't really care, but they say the causes of this are diabetes, which damages the nerve control of the intestinal muscles, scleroderma, which I'll actually put a link in the description. You can check out our YouTube we did, as well as a blog we did on scleroderma. And they say, because well, they say it's scleroderma, but we say because it damaged the uh, um, intestinal muscles directly. Low thyroid function leads to recirculation of estrogen. People that are thyroid deficient are typically estrogen dominant. Estrogen decreases O2 at the, at the cell level, which creates hypoxia, stimulating collagen production, which leads to scleroderma. So we could say that SIBO is a symptom, it's not a disease, a symptom of hypothyroidism. We could say that, I'm saying it, and it actually is. Or IBS and things like that. Risk factors, I think that's causes, but we use a cool term, risk factors, makes it sound a little more interesting. Low stomach acid, that could be from not eating enough protein, but I'll kind of talk about that. IBS, celiac, gluten intolerance, you know, bowel surgery, diabetes, multiple uses of antibiotics throughout the year, over years, organ dysfunction like cirrhosis of the liver or pancreatitis or renal failure and things like that. And of course, people, their symptoms are gas and bloating and diarrhea, constipation, they have weight loss, they have fatigue, vitamin and nutrient deficiencies and abdominal pain and all these things, which is very common. I would say most people have SIBO, self-induced bacterial overgrowth. Now, let's rewind it a little bit. I've talked about this a million and one times, so you can check out our other YouTubes, but I'm going to really simplify it. The body has two decisions at the cell levels because the cells actually are the director of all the systems. The cells either produce energy or produce lactic acid. So produce energy or produce inflammation. You want to produce energy because it puts you in a metabolic state. If you're producing lactic acid, you're not producing energy, you're not using glucose efficiently at the cell level, you're not storing glycogen in the liver, you're not converting or producing thyroid hormone, so now you're in a hypometabolic state. When your body is stressed and it's running from a lion, it's not thinking about digesting and breaking down food or going to the bathroom. You're thinking about running from a lion. This was shown by Hans Celier, Dr. Timmons, Ray Pete, many others 
to show that digestive juices in the GI system actually slow down by over 50%, hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzymes, as well as digestive activity actually slows down, which can lead to constipation, and many other issues like bacterial overgrowth. You're not thinking about procreating. You're not thinking about anything else but running from a lion. So your digestive system actually slows down. Now you're putting yourself into a hypometabolic, you know, we could say a subclinical hypothyroid state. Now, of course, there's many things that lead to that. Of course, if you don't eat the right foods, right ratios of foods, frequency of foods, the right amount of foods to meet our metabolic needs on a daily basis so we can fuel our system. But of course, there's certain foods like we talk about polyunsaturated fats, a diet that's too high in starches or even uncooked starches, or a diet that's too high in fiber actually support bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, such as grains, beans, cruciferous veggies that are not cooked, or cruciferous veggies that are cooked, lentils, breads, and alcohol. Those foods support bacterial overgrowth. The body has a really hard time breaking these things down. We're not ruminant animals. And I'll, I'll read something from our program here based off the work of Ray Pete. Roughage is the staple diet of ruminant animals that have a digestive system that is uniquely different from humans. Their ruminants were humans. Ruminant animals are able to digest foods high in cellulose. We can't. That's why they eat grass. And that's the only food they actually should eat. The stomach of ruminant animals has four compartments compared to human stomachs, which usually have one or have one. The rumen is the largest section of four and is the main digestive center. It's filled with billions of tiny microorganisms, which provides the ability to break down grass and other coarse vegetation that the animals with one stomach cannot digest. We are not rumens. We cannot break down all these fibers and cellulose and starches. Rumens can. Now, according to Loritano et al. in 2007, from Therapeutic Advances in Gastroenterology, they say that bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine is caused by hypothyroidism. Going back to the cell producing energy or producing lactic acid, which, infl which is inflammation, which throws you into a hypometabolic state. Slows everything down. Slows down peristalsis. Slows down digestive juices. Slows down hydrochloric acid. What did I say? Risk factor? Low stomach acid. All these things are going to lead to IBS and, and, and GI issues. Of course, if you're eating food that you can't break down, you're going to have trouble. Go take a head of lettuce and put it in a bag and let it sit there for a week. What's it going to do? It's going to rot. That's exactly what's happening in our system. If we're not releasing enzymes and nutrients and things to break down these foods, we can't break it down and they rot. Now, at the same time, as I mentioned, we have a hard time breaking down cellulose and these fibers and unsaturated fats. That's why humans should really stay away from as much as they can the grains, the beans, the cruciferous veggies, lentils, breads, and alcohol. Anything that affects the movement of the villi and microvilli in the small intestine will lead to an increase in bacteria in the small intestine. This actually leads to the inability as well to break down lactose, sucrose, and fats because our microvilli release lactase to break down lactose, sucrase to break down sucrose, and lacteals to break down fats. That's why you see people having issues breaking down food and they see the food actually in their stool because the very food you're eating you cannot break down. Now remember, as I mentioned, and this was shown by um, Laura Tano as well as Ray Pete and others, um, Dr. Young, uh, that thyroid deficiency decreases GI motility, as I just mentioned. I'm just saying it and repeating it in a different way so it makes sense. And if we're eating these foods and we can't break them down, it's going to lead to a bacterial overgrowth. It's plain and simple. You're eating foods that you can't break down. Now, of course, we teach people how to eat the right foods and the right ratios and frequencies to meet their needs on a metabolic level. So they're actually increasing their metabolic rate, increasing, seen through body temperature and pulse, increasing glycogen storage, thyroid hormone conversion, leading to the production of energy. Now, don't forget, I was reading a little Chris Cresser the other day. He mentioned that 20% of T4 is converted to T3 in the GI tract. 
So of course, if we have GI issues, we're gonna it's gonna lead to a thyroid issue. The other 80% is actually converted peripherally in the liver. So the bottom line is that if we have thyroid suppression, that could be from a stress, doesn't matter. If we're not meeting our metabolic needs, we're gonna suppress the thyroid. This is seen in body temperature and pulse based off the work of Broden Barnes. It's gonna slow down digestion, slow down digestive juices. We're not gonna be able to break down these foods. It's gonna to lead to fermentation, the beans, the veggies, etc., which are gonna to lead to the fermentation, the bacterial overgrowth. Now, most people are recommending supplements upon supplements upon supplements upon supplements upon supplements upon supplements upon labs upon labs upon labs upon labs upon labs. To treat humans through a lab, which cannot be done, you take an emotional component away. There's a huge detachment there. At the same time, they're using an allopathic philosophy, which is basically giving you supplements to treat a symptom instead of giving you medication. So if you don't like allopathic medicine, but you're taking supplements based on a lab, you're doing the exact same thing. They're just pulling the wool over your eyes to not let you think you are, but you are. You're in this position not because you're supplement deficient. You're in this position because you're not meeting your metabolic needs on a cellular level with food. Hippocrates said this a long time ago, let food be thy medicine, and we're still trying to figure it out. Most people recommend the GAPS diet to treat the GI system. We don't look at the body as a single system. We look at the body as a system of systems. And if we begin to eat the right foods, the non-inflammatory carbs, proteins, and fats, which we teach people when we do this one-on-one, -on -one, so if you want a free one-on-one -on -one consult for 15 minutes, go to our website, fill out the form. But our goal is to teach people how to use food, to actually use food as their supplement to heal. So we don't recommend the supplements. We don't recommend the GAPS diet because we want to treat the body as a whole. We don't want to treat the symptom. We recommend people staying away from above ground vegetables when they're in the state. Limit the amount of polyunsaturated fats they're taking in because they increase fermentation. And they have a similar action as estrogen in the body. And estrogen not only leads to blood sugar handling issues, but inhibits thyroid hormone conversion in the liver. Using more right tropical fruits, using more overcooked roots in moderation because they are a starch with the addition of fat to help slow down the digestion of them, but some people can't actually utilize them because of the starch. Increasing their broth intake because broth not only is a protein, it's a non-inflammatory protein because it doesn't contain tryptophan and cysteine, but it's healing to the GI system and will stimulate hydrochloric acid. Of course, eating it with a carbohydrate and fat at all times, adding some coconut oil to it, maybe having some fruit with it. Increasing the use of a raw carrot, uh, one to two times per day or bamboo shoots with a meal. Bottom line is the raw carrot and bamboo shoots contain a fiber that we can't break down. It sweeps the system and actually absorbs toxins and recirculating estrogen. So you're using the carrot as a supplement to kind of brush the system out to get rid of these toxins. It's the consistency of using them over time raw, one to two per day, um, that actually helps clean the system out and take the burden off the liver and help the body prevent the recirculation of estrogen. As well as eating regularly throughout the day, as we've talked about before on one of our YouTubes, food frequency is king. So hopefully you've enjoyed this YouTube. I have. Hopefully you can get away from using the word SIBO, self-induced bacterial overgrowth. Hopefully this video makes sense and you throw your supplements away. Find someone that's going to teach you how to use food as your supplement to regulate thyroid health, to control and conduct the other systems, which is the GI system. Peace.